Fishing has been an essential feature of Cape Ann since long before English settlers came here in 1623. Nearly 400 years later, it could be considered the most significant element of her historical narrative. The purpose of this story is to look back at a key turning point of fishing life in Gloucester, the 1930s and 40s, when powered trawlers finally replaced the classic dory boat schooners that held sway off our coast for centuries. It is the story of the men who worked the waterfront as remembered from someone who witnessed and took part in these events as a young man. In the 1850s, young men immigrated to Gloucester from Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, drawn by the lucrative fish market. In a few years, demand for laborers increased as 1,600 Gloucestermen left town to serve in the Civil War. The Canadians brought years of skill handed down from generations of forebears who worked the many North Atlantic fishing banks adjacent to their shore. But with the completion of transcontinental railroads and improvements of food preparation, Gloucester's fish-centric economy blossomed with opportunity. By the mid-1880s, Gloucester was a roaring boomtown. Its harbor, home to over 500 vessels that required a substantial fish-related infrastructure. There were 30 fish-curing establishments and 60 wholesale fish dealers. Ancillary businesses proliferated, creating everything from anchors to foghorns. To quote the great naval architect Thomas McManus, vessels were cheap to build, fishermen were abundantly available, safety issues were of little concern for the owners, and sadly, vessels and the crews that sailed them were considered expendable. dory fishing had to be one of the most dangerous of all livelihoods. In 1879 alone, 249 men were lost in 29 vessels, half of which went down in a single storm in February. In the 1920s, you were away three months, three months to the Grand Banks for a salt fish trip, and come in after three months and make $100 and find your wife with a grocery bill at the company store, which exceeded what you had shared on the vessel's trip. Three months away from your family, three months without taking a shower, three months without any interaction with the outside world, confined aboard this vessel, to say nothing of the medical emergencies and so forth. There was no weather reporting. You left on a sunny day, and a hurricane could be right behind you. That's what happened in the August gale of 1927. More men were lost in that storm than in any other calamity in the fishing industry in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, or in fact, even in Gloucester. The work was relentless and the weather unpredictable, but a technological breakthrough was soon to come from Germany. Rudolf Diesel, studying thermodynamics, knew that steam engines wasted 90% of the energy available in its fuel. This led to his invention of an internal combustion crude oil engine. Locally, steam and gas engines had become frequent by the early 1920s, but it would take until later that decade for vastly improved diesel engines to find their way into Gloucester's fishing fleet. They would revolutionize the local industry and essentially end the age of sail. Along with the diesel, the outer trawl method of harvesting bottom fish and Clarence Birdseye's flash freezing process would all help establish Gloucester as the premier fishing port of the world. Every once in a while, somebody comes along that's a, a leader in their chosen field. That's what Ben Pine was. Ben Pine was a vessel manager. He was an outfitter. He operated a very successful company that took care of at least 30% of the fishing fleet in Gloucester. By that, I mean the Nova Scotian Canadian people all gravitated to his wharf because he was one of them.
He talked the same language. Ben Pine was a natural leader, and he was a businessman extraordinaire. He just was born to lead the cost of fisheries as far as the Nova Scotian Canadian maritime segment of the industry. His expertise was in the management business and in the publicity business and in the promotion of the fisheries in and of itself. Who would ever think of sailing a vessel to the World's Fair, the Chicago World's Fair, or sailing the vessel in the doldrums of the Depression to Washington, D.C. to meet uh, President Roosevelt and promote the industry as a whole for all of New England, not just Costa, but for New England. He was a, a giant in his time. He was everything to the community. He was everything to the industry. He thought always of the big picture, and yet he could bring himself right down to the individual with the ordinary man on the street. He was liked by everybody. People used to tell me, you can dress Ben Pine up in a hot Schaffner and Mark suit, and he still looks like he came out of a fish hole. Well, translated, that means that even if you put a tuxedo on him, he identified with the ordinary man. He was that kind of a guy. And he loved kids, and he loved me, and that's how I feel about it. Ben Pine was born on September 10, 1883, in Balorum, a barren fishing village on the south coast of Newfoundland. When he was 10 years old, he made his way to Gloucester, where his entire life would be in one way or the other, bound to the sea. He worked around dory fishing schooners for a time, but early on he realized he was cut out for other things. Beginning as a harbor junk peddler, Pine found, bought, and traded fishing gear needed by the captains and crews who were perpetually entering and leaving Gloucester Harbor. It took him 20 years. He started out as a businessman and rowing from one vessel to the other in the harbor, buying junk and buying cordage and, and uh, leads and so forth and so on. He parlayed that into a successful outfitting and vessel management company. His business grew and by 1922 led to the forming of the Atlantic Maritime Company at 33 Rogers Street, across from where the Cape Ann Savings Bank is today. Atlantic Maritime outfitted mackerel saners, dory trawlers, swordfishmen, and eventually diesel-powered draggers. Ben became financially involved by owning shares in many of these vessels and was usually the designated manager of vessels operating from his Atlantic Maritime wharf. Piney, as he was known, was a man of many talents. He was a great friend, teacher, and mentor to many of the boat captains and crew members. He was unmatched as a promoter, bringing all kinds of media attention to Gloucester and to the New England fisheries. And his skill at the helm of a schooner was legendary. The same could be said of his generosity. There's a long history associated with the schooner races. It goes way back to the early 1900s. Uh, and of course, the rivalry uh, uh, was intense when fishing on the banks because the Nova Scotian vessels only had to travel out 50, 60 miles, and they were on the fishing banks. The Gloucester vessels had to travel three, four, five hundred miles, a thousand miles to get to the Grand Banks. So they needed to be sleeker and faster but in comparison because they had to make market. When the competition started up, these same Canadians uh, in Glossa, uh, uh, now newly minted U.S. citizens, were really sailing in competition against their uncles and fathers and grandfathers down in Nova Scotia. So it was like one big family, except for the competitive part, and they weren't to be outdone in Nova Scotia by any of their grandsons or sons in, in the United States. The International Fishermen's Races started formally in October of 1920. 
the Halifax Herald challenged Gloucester's fishermen to a race between our nation's fastest schooner to be selected and their recognized Canadian champion, the Delawana. The rules stipulated the boats would be powered by wind alone. Auxiliary engines could not be aboard. By that time, the diesel engine and power had entered the fleet as early as 1900, so by 1920, many vessels had installed auxiliary power. There were few all-sailing schooners to compete in this invitation that was extended by the Halifax Herald. Just about that time, in October, the Esperanto, a vessel built in Essex in 1906, designed by Thomas F. McManus, was coming in from a salt fish trip. She was an all-sail vessel with no auxiliary engine, and she had a reputation of being a flying fisherman. Extensive repairs and a glistening paint job were hastily performed, and on October 25th, Esperanto proudly sailed for Halifax, Nova Scotia, as thousands of Gloucesterites lined the wharves, cheering her on to victory. Captain Marty Welch was in command of a hand-picked crew of some of the most able men out of Gloucester. Esperanto won both races, a $4,000 cash purse, and the first International Fisherman's Trophy. And the Dennis Cup from the Mr. Dennis of the Halifax Herald was stowed in the fish hole and the Gloucester vessel Esperanto left with a brand new broom lashed to her masthead in the fore topmast and she was bound for Gloucester. When she arrived at the telegraph office on the corner of Middle Street and Pleasant Street still standing, the ticket tape was up above and my dad told me a hundred, two hundred people were outside Traffic couldn't get up and down Pleasant Street, tossing teams in those days because of the crowd that was gathered outside of the telegraph office. It was a grand and glorious time. That started it all. The next year, the Esperanto went aground on Sable Island Bar, the Northwest Bar, and she was a total loss. The Nova Scotians, recognizing that they needed a faster vessel, designed and built the famous Blue Nose. Gloucester was without a contender. Angus J. Walters of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, had been a fisherman since the age of 14 and a schooner captain at 23. He gained local fame for the speed at which he could bring a boatload of fish to market. Having missed the first international schooner race in 1920 after breaking a mast in a qualifying race, he was game to compete. Walters was a Freemason, as were members of the newly formed race committee. They had commissioned Halifax Marine architect William J. Rue to design an ultimate schooner specifically for the purpose of winning the international races. They asked Angus Walters to be its captain and the Blue Nose would become the most famous ship in Canadian history, its image engraved on every Canadian dime since 1937. With the sinking of the Esperanto just a few months prior, the Blue Nose easily won its first competition against Gloucester's replacement, the smaller Elsie, in 1921. Along came a vessel called the Puritan, designed for racing, she was a beautiful vessel, probably the fastest vessel that ever sailed from the city of Gloucester, in command of Captain Jeff Thomas, famous for his vessel, the Adventure, which is in Gloucester to this date. Jeff Thomas was at the wheel, and she sailed fishing in 1922. Ben Pine had risen to prominence among the Canadian-born fishermen who dominated the Gloucester waterfront in the 1920s. Pine's relationship with the Puritan was aptly described by Mark de Villiers in his 2009 book, Witch in the Wind. The public face of the Puritan was a well-known Gloucester fishing skipper, Jeff Thomas, but the real driving force was Ben Pine, a Newfoundlander who had built a Gloucester junk business into a formidable fishing fleet. Pine was a bluff man with equal amounts of charm and ruthlessness, 
He was known for his charity to indigenous seamen and lost boys on the wharves of his adopted city, but also as a man who didn't scruple to bankrupt his opponents. He moved easily between the working fishermen himself, he'd been to sea though never as a working man, but he loved the life and was caught up in the romance of the races. The vessel lasted just three months. She was so fast that in the fog, he overshot his mark and the vessel went ashore on the northwest bar of Sable Island, across the bar, into the ocean beyond, and a total loss. Now what to do? What, what, what should they do? Well, time went on, and finally they built the Columbia. Just a shade smaller, a few feet shorter, than the famous Puritan. She was the last salt banker, dory trawler, to be launched out of Essex without auxiliary power. She did not have a shaft log. She did not have any provision for having diesel power installed. She was a total, authentic, sail-carrying schooner. She was designed with the fishermen's races in mind. Ben Pine himself and four or five other of businessmen, and they put together the money and the investment in the Columbia. I might say that of all the vessels that Ben Pine owned and managed over the years, maybe 50, maybe even 75, very few of those vessels did he own outright. He always had shares in seed money. He was the one that promoted and secured the financing, but he did it with many others. His money was not always at risk. The Columbia easily won the qualifying rounds off Gloucester to compete in the 1926 race and made it to Halifax just in time to begin the competition. The two boats and crew were so evenly matched the Blue Nose beat the Columbia by only 50 seconds in the first race and by 90 seconds in the second race but the race committee gave Columbia the second round as the Blue Nose passed a buoy on the wrong side, a rule that had been instituted the night before. Angus Walters, claiming not to have known about the rule change, was never one to appreciate fussy race rules. To him, the whole point of a race was to be first across the finish line. Incensed with losing by a technicality, he declined to race the third round. With the Blue Nose now disqualified, the race committee told Ben Pine if he sailed the third race himself, he could take home the cup. Ben's answer is the stuff of legend. I came here to race the Blue Nose, he said, not to go for a sail. And with that, he returned to Gloucester without the prize. With the race forfeit by both sides, the purse was split in half, and the Blue Nose remained undefeated. Angus Walters was a cantankerous old fuddy-duddy. He was a poor loser, if anything else, and he would walk away. Ben Pine was a sportsman. They had a rivalry, and Ben Pine was right there when the time came to fight over every inch of waterway that they competed against. Angus Walters was a, a grumpy guy, but he was a, a, a great fisherman and he was a great, even greater sail handler. And he had probably the best boat that ever sailed the Atlantic in international fishing races. Ben Pine considered the Columbia the finest piece of wood that ever sailed around Eastern Point. It's the Columbia image that's on his tombstone in Oak Grove Cemetery in Gloucester facing Washington Street for all to see. The Columbia was really his pride and joy. He did not prevail. The Columbia did not take any series in her lifetime. Unfortunately, the Columbia was sunk on August 24th, 1927, in the great August Gale, when eight or ten Nova Scotian vessels and the Columbia were anchored off of Sable Island, and a hurricane came down and all these vessels were lost. <laughs>
The Columbia went down with all hands, including a 17-year-old young boy. So here we are without a contender. This is in 1927. Two years went by and Piney conceived the idea of the Gertrude L. Tebow. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, Gloucester's last great challenger was being constructed in the Essex shipyard. Having been financed by a syndicate that included the New Jersey millionaire and Eastern Point resident, Louis A. Tebow, the Gertrude L. Tebow was locally considered a harbinger of good fortune. Designed by the Bostonian naval architect Frank Payne, she was built and outfitted at a cost of nearly $80,000, making her the most expensive fishing schooner ever made, although clearly her sole purpose was to win races. Ben Pine convinced a half a dozen processing firms men prominent in the fishing industry to contribute $5,000 apiece. With that seed money, he went to a financier on Eastern Point, Louis A. Thibault. He himself probably suffered great losses during the 1929 crash, but he was a racing enthusiast. He convinced Louis Thibault to invest $40,000 in a contender for the International Fishermen's Cup. His wife, Gertrude L., contributed 10000 On March 17, 1930, the Gertrude L. Tebow was launched with great fanfare in Essex. This vessel, while she had to be a bona fide fisherman, was really built to be an international contender and take the cup away from the Blue Nose. She was launched in time to qualify for the 1930 Lipton Cup races off Gloucester, which the media-savvy Pine helped cook up as part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony's 300th anniversary celebration. Angus Walters, still steamed about the events of 1926, played hard to get and cited the need for costly repairs they couldn't afford. Ben, ever the consummate promoter, most likely was committed to the race on many levels. Not taking no for an answer, he came up with the $10,000 the Blue Nose needed for retrofitting and sealed the deal. The Blue Nose, showing her age, lost the first round and was leading in the second race when the weather worsened, causing the race to be canceled for lack of visibility. Angus was furious with the race committee. On the next attempt a few days later, he made a rare navigational error, allowing the Tebow to take the prize. Angus took personal responsibility for the loss, but would not allow blame to sully the Blue Nose, saying, The Tebow didn't beat Blue Nose, she beat me. As this was not an official race between the U.S. and Canada, the loss meant nothing to the Lunenburgers, who continued to claim the Blue Nose was undefeated. By 1937, the popularity of the MGM film Captain's Courageous would put Gloucester in the spotlight as the nation embraced the film's nostalgic and overly sentimental view of schooners and dory boat fishing. Eager to capitalize on this, the Master Mariners Association sent Ben Pine to Halifax to renew the international fishermen's races, this time as a best-in-five challenge off Boston and Gloucester. To Angus Walters, by now in his 50s, it was a hard sell. He wanted to move on from fishing. Besides, his wife had died, and he was getting ready to marry a former Halifax barmaid still in her 20s. The Blue Nose was 18 years old and again would need at least $10,000 worth of rehabbing, money that wouldn't be coming out of his pocket. Ben Pine leaned on Boston friends and raised $8,000, this turned out to be enough to motivate Nova Scotians to come up with the rest. On October 6th, the Blue Nose docked in Gloucester. On board were 40 tons of ballast in the form of pig iron bars, 
which would be used to compensate for the weight of the engines, blocking, shafts, and bearings after removal. Once in Gloucester, each race boat was trimmed by adding or removing ballast so their water lines met the approval of the race committee. The rule stated that once the water lines were approved, no ballast could be added or reduced until the final race was over. Depending on wind conditions, more or less weight could allow the Blue Nose to handle better, so not being fond of race committee regulations, Walters quietly moved iron in and out of the schooner in the dead of night, depending on conditions predicted for race day. Sensing this might be the case, Ben Pine's partner, Miss Ray Adams, never one to mess with, hired a security guard to discreetly monitor the wharf overnight. She ultimately caught them red-handed, and the details hit the papers. Amazingly, the race committee decided not to penalize the Blue Nose. They were probably worried Walters would sail away in a huff as he had been bitterly complaining about the conduct of the race committee for weeks. They also weren't ready to squander the media frenzy, which had built up the match to Herculean proportions. And so it was that the Gertrude L. Tebow and the Blue Nose each took two races and were tied when the fifth and final race was held that October of 1938. It was finally the moment that Gloucester had been waiting for since 1921. A health flare-up put Ben Pine in the hospital after the second race. Ben Pine was not in good health. He turned the command over to his best friend, Captain Cecil Moulton, and it was Cecil Moulton that uh, competed with the Blue Nose in the remaining races, and the Blue Nose won. Eighteen-year-old mast headsman and future Hollywood movie star Sterling Hayden worked high aloft and distinguished himself by inching out on a spar to secure a loose block, a deed described as heroic in the following day's newspaper accounts. In breezes that Ben Pine complained were so light you could have paddled a canoe around the course, the Blue Nose won the final race by less than three minutes after sailing 35 and a half miles. Insults were thrown from both sides. Moulton cited the illegal movement of the ballast. Angus complained the Tebow carried too much sail. Both crews complained about the lack of wind, but when the time came to present the Halifax Cup, it was nowhere to be found. Days later, it showed up at an orphanage, the New England home for little wanderers, with a poem attached. It read, Here's to Angus, good old sport whose challenge sort of takes a shot. Send us a gale that blows at 30, and we'd bet our shirts on little Gertie. It is perhaps sad that races intended to be a test of skill and goodwill between the nations ultimately accomplished neither of those things. But although the Halifax Cup would continue to live in Lunenburg, Gloucester would forever cherish those two races when their beloved Gertie left Angus Walters and the mighty Blue Nose in its wake. The last three working dory trawler schooners were the Marjorie Parker, the Shamrock, and the Adventure. Built in the mid-1920s, these vessels lingered on until the early 1950s. The last of these was the Adventure. Launched from the James Yard in Essex, Mass. on September 16, 1926, the Adventure was a Thomas F. McManus-designed knockabout schooner, so-called due to McManus's innovation of eliminating the bowsprit. Measuring 122 feet in length, she was first owned and operated out of Gloucester by Captain Jeff Thomas, who had sailed the Puritan in 1922. Thomas tragically suffered a fatal heart attack at the wheel only a few years later. By 1930, the vessel was sold to Boston Interests, and for her remaining career, she fished out of Boston under Captain Leo Hines. <laughs> 
Boston was the center of the New England groundfish business. This was due to its large steam and diesel-powered beam trawler fleet and its proximity to the fresh fish consumer markets. Adventure landed nearly 4 million pounds worth of groundfish during a successful career, which ended near the end of 1953, as there just weren't the number of experienced crew members available to keep her going. Now, if ever you wanted to understand why dory fishing was over in 1925 when the diesel engine came in, you only had to go aboard the Adventure on a cold February day out of the Boston Fish Pier. The engineer, Fred Thomas, jingled up the engine and we were on our way to Brown's Bank. And 27 men were aboard that vessel. 12 double dories, two men in each dory, 24 men went over the side and fished. The engineer, the cook, and Captain Leo Hines were aboard the vessel along with yours truly. The captain was 50 years old. Two other men were in their 50s. The rest, 24 men, were all 65 and over. These were old men. They were tired. They were worn out. And they were in a labor-intensive fishery. The work started on the adventure long before she sailed from the fish pier in 1951. The ice was taken. 5,000 pounds of mackerel, frozen mackerel bait were loaded aboard in 40-pound cardboard cartons. The grub was stowed below in the fish hole. There was so much food to feed 27 men for 10 days that it required not only the refrigerator in the forecastle, but the wing pens in the fish hole for the cook to do his business in the forecastle. Four meals a day. There wasn't one man that wasn't at work on that vessel. And the work continued for the next eight days around the clock. I can say without question that this business was over and done with in 1925 when new, modern, powered, diesel-powered vessels were coming into the fleet. It was over then, but the old men that participated or continued on in the industry in two or three vessels from 1925 to 1953, those old men refused to change, and it was their life and their work, and it's what they did. Contrast that with a dragger crew, and there's no comparison. Because you see, a dragger crew, to begin with, is only 10 men. 12 at the very most. As soon as they take ice and leave the wharf, the watch is set, but seven or eight men of those 10 all turn in, play cards, and dole away their time. It was a monotonous job, but it was not labor intensive by any means. Once they got to the Grand Banks in a vessel like the Felicia, it only took them two, two and a half days to fill the vessel up, 250,000 pounds of redfish. The adventure was gone eight days, and we caught a total of 80,000 pounds of fish. So that's the difference. The men worked far less, and they received much more pay. And that spelled doom to the dory trawling industry. It was just a question of when it would end, and it lingered on for another 25 years. The vessels disbanded, the crews went their way, and men retired, and it was the end of an era. Dragging greatly increased the volume and frequency of fish landed. Fish were everywhere, from Ipswich Bay to the Gulf of Maine, from George's Bank to the Grand Banks and beyond. As the Highliner, Captain Lloyd Campbell of the Hilda Garson exclaimed, The redfish was eating the keel out of the boat. Gloucester, was on the threshold of a golden age, and by the middle of 1945, grammar school textbooks would recognize Gloucester as the world's leading fishing port.